Okay, my name is Michael Carter. Most of you know that. Uh, to start with, as usual, I welcome my mother, Mary Carter, who's here, with her friend Jean Johns. How's that? That's got to be better. Uh, also, my wife, Paulette, who's here again. Yay, Paulette. And I'm not supposed to introduce them, but my grandsons are here. I won't say who they are, but uh, they're here. <laughs> and then my cousins, uh, Bernie, Nat, Joe, and Penny are here. They always back me up in case there's trouble. So glad they're here. To begin with, Susan Dyer of the History Center wants to make a small statement, short statement. As always, Michael is kind enough to let us um, make a few announcements about what's going on at the History Center. So I've got a bunch of them today. Um, for those of you who have not heard, we now have a Monroe County First Families program. If your family was here before David, is it 1850? Yes. Uh, and you can prove that through your genealogy. Um, we have a program that you can get involved in. And if you would like more information, we do have these flyers up here. Uh, let's see, there's going to be a headstone restoration workshop at Rose Hill Cemetery. So this is um, our cemetery committee as well as the Prospect Hill neighborhood doing that and that is on Saturday, June 1st and Saturday, September 21. They're actually going to be raising some of the headstones of some of the veterans that are in there. It's really very cool. So that flyer's up there as well. Uh, we are doing another history harvest, this time in Unionville at the Senior Center there, and this is June 4th at, from 1 to 3, and we are looking for photographs of the Unionville area before 1970. So if you've got anything, photographs, documents, letters, anything like that, we will scan them. You get to keep them for your collection, and we get to have them then um, that we can use digitally. And then our last one is this Thursday, we are doing our first care partner workshop. This is part of our um, dementia-friendly programming that we're starting. And this is basically, if you have someone in your life that is living with dementia, we have a lot of different programs now at the History Center that are available for free. So this is uh, a chance to show you what we've got um, so, and the resources that you can use. This is free. And lunch will be provided by Autumn Hills. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Now, we'll hear from our Minister of Propaganda, George, like we always do. Okay, George, you're on. Give me the mic, Mike. <laughs> Good afternoon. Glad that you all came here. We have a real bountiful opportunity for to remember history in this in this city and Thank you for coming here to help us make history, remembering history. I'd like to introduce my wife, Mary Ann Carpenter. I would also like to thank everyone for coming. Particularly, I'd like to thank the Legion and the, the volunteers. Please be generous to our servers. They work hard for this, so uh, uh, be nice to them. Like, Yes, and give them a hand, by all means. I see her standing back and back like our manager, Sharon. Thank you very much for what you do, Sharon. We appreciate it. How many of you are here for the first time? If you would like to be on our email distribution list, please see me at the end of the meeting. I'll take your email address and include you on our monthly distribution. Also, how many of you have been getting the emails? If, uh, are they, do you find them to be useful? Yes. 
at any time anybody ever wants to get off of the email list, let me know. It's not meant to be able to, something you have to drag through, but I'm supposed to make that announcement ever so often uh, to be able to clear an email list if nobody wants to be on it. <clears throat> Last but certainly not least, always thank CATS for coming here because they make the future publications of our, our, our presentations readily available on YouTube. It's always great to have CATS here. I guess in the fall, we're going to have uh, CATS give a presentation on CATS, which I think will be just great. You have a tremendous benefit in this community having uh, CATS with you here. That's all I have to say. Anybody else got anything for the good of the cause? Here's Mikey. All right, George, thanks. Uh, real quick, uh, future programs that we've got, and we're booked all the way through next January, believe it or not. Uh, next month, June 25th, Brad Cook of IU Photo Archives will return to show more vintage local photos. Uh, I'm not even sure which, how much, which ones he's going to show, but he's been here five times, and people have liked, liked him every time he's been here. It'll be interesting. Uh, July 16th, Hillary Kleck of the Monroe County History Center will give what we call a bonus program because it's in the middle of the month, not at the end of the month, uh, entitled Peter Matthews Civil War Diary and the 19th Indiana Infantry. Uh, and July 4th, which would be, or uh, excuse me, July 30th, which would be our regular program, George Carpenter here, who's the expert on the Monon Railroad, will give a, a really great I program. I forgot more about the Monon, I'll let know. <laughs> anyway, you're giving it, and, and, and they'll like it, because we, we've, seen, we've seen it before, but it's been a while. Uh, August 27th, John Summerlaw will give a program on IU and its military history. Uh, September 24th, this will mark the bicentennial month of the first Presbyterian Church in Bloomington, and local historian Owen Johnson will present its history. He gave the, the uh, presentation on Ernie Pyle last year. Uh, October 29th, Randy Richardson will give a program entitled Once Upon a Time in Monroe County, Stories from Our Past, the earliest stories from 1857, and the latest as a business began in 1920 and is still doing well. There'll be something that picks the interest of everyone. November 26th, local historian and author Derek Ritchie, who's been a, a uh, constant contributor, uh, will give a program on the Laberto and Hunter Mansions on North College and North Walda and the families who resided there many moons ago. Uh, December is open, and that's when we may have cats in there, but I may have, I'm going to have to talk to Michael to see about that. Uh, in January 28, 2020, local historian David Nord will give a program entitled Power, Transport, and Machinery, the Revolution in Flour Milling in Indiana, including Monroe County, 1820 to 1920. Uh, today we have uh, James Capshu, uh, an IU historian. Uh, he's a member of uh, BHS's last graduating class, 1972. Uh, okay, how about the class of 64? Class of <laughs> uh, uh, Okay, 71, that, that's good. All these younger underclassmen. <laughs> uh, Jim uh, obtained his baccalaureate degree from IU in 1979 and his doctorate from University of Pennsylvania in 86. Since 1990, he has served on the IU faculty in the Department of History and Philosophy of Science and Medicine. He was appointed uh, Indiana University historian in, in 2015 and is assisting with plans for the IU bicentennial. Uh, this program, uh, concerns uh, on the eve of IU's bicentennial year, it behooves us to re-examine the historical record of the university. Who were the past writers of the university history? What were their preoccupations, assumptions, and approaches? How were they shaped by the circumstances in which they wrote? This presentation will explore some familiar names in the historiography of IU, as well as shed light on others who have been neglected and undervalued. So here's Dr. Caccio. Thank you so much for thank you so much for inviting me to 
talk today. Um, I see some classmates from the class of 72, <coughs> and also some other friends. Um, class of 71. <laughs> yes, class of 71 is represented, I see that, yeah. Um, so it's hard to think about how to approach the history of Indiana University. It's been 200 years, almost, since it started. It's been around, we had something like 800,000 alumni. Over a million st students have been to IU over that 200 years. Um, it's huge, it's got a lot of programs and facilities and campuses all over the state. So how do you do that? So one thing we need to do is to start thinking about stories. So let me see if I, this works. Okay, so how do we know about the past from stories, okay? Who tells the stories, okay? In the case of the university, uh, students, faculty, alumni, and, 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 and donors and people like that who tell those stories. Other people also tell those stories too. So it's of, of interest to a, a, broad, a broad community. What I'm interested in is how those stories have changed over time, okay? History is a moving target, okay? We know more than we did before, but then we forget a lot too. So how do we sort of uh, traverse the historical record here? <clears throat> so let me talk sort of theoretically right now about what is history. So history is a dialogue, okay? It's, it's a conversation with the past, in the present, but it's also about the future. And so this is from Douglas Adair, who's an American historian. I like that definition of history, what that does, okay? So it's, it's a sense that we are using the materials of the past, but we have certain issues that we're dealing with in the present, and it's really about the future, how to understand uh, where we might be going. So what is a university? So this in a very simple way, a university is consist of places, people, and programs, okay? Universities are place-based institutions. It does matter where this is Indiana University in southern Indiana. It, the, the state's history matters. The people of Indiana University, it's the faculty, the students, the staff, the presidents, the townspeople, the taxpayers of Indiana. So there's a lot of people involved uh, in universities and people have been associated with, with people, with universities uh, at the beginning. And then programs, not just the curricular programs, but the extracurricular programs, the facilities, the, all of the different things that you have known about Indiana University, that's part of the university. And so, so how do we start thinking about what are the functions of university history, okay? Now this is very uh, um, straightforward here. So basically, university history contributes to identity of the university matters, like, you know, uh, um, Harvard University is the oldest university in, in, the, in the country. And they have a long ter tradition, and it's part of uh, their identity uh, as an institution. There's also, it, uh, uh, university history continues to, to the image of the university. Um, I'll talk more about this a little later, but the idea, when you think about Indian University, people think about the place the campus, the beautiful campus, and how that's ch changed and grown over time. But also speaks to the university integrity, right? That you want to have a degree that matters, that still has worth for many, many years, okay? So, so it does matter, and so the university ha you know, makes an agreement with the students to say, yes, we're gonna continue, and we're gonna continue our, our standards, and we are going to uh, make your degree still worthwhile. 
<clears throat> so that's a kind of a general introduction to about where how I how I approach history and how what what it means to me. So then, why do we visit? Why do we revisit the history of IU? Uh, there's three different areas that that I'm going to focus on. One is it captures new voices in the history of IU. Uh, we'll talk more about the, 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 the basic narrative that have been uh, put forth um, by mostly white uh, male historians. But there's a lot, a lot of people who've contributed to the history uh, that you might not know much about. So we're trying to get more voices into that history. <clears throat> it's also iterative, the idea that it's not one thing, you, it's not, history is not one thing that will continue. It's basically you have to re-examine and re-interpret, okay? So it's a process of, we know, we know more about certain ep episodes over time. And that leads to the third thing, it's cumulative, right? That uh, we have uh, a current understanding, but then if you start looking at history, you can add to that uh, history. <clears throat> so my project right now that I'm going to talk about is uh, a book I'm writing uh, called Hidden Histories of Indiana University, Bicentennial Excavations. Okay, that's kind of a wordy title, but, uh, and I, I do use the plural uh, because it's not just one history, there's many histories. <clears throat> and so my main goal is to investigate how the landscape the educational programs and the institutional identity have been shaped over time. That's the basic um, problem that I'm in investigating. Uh, and I'm going to talk who, about the not just the historians and the archivists, but it's about the the uh, landscape designers, the architects of Indiana University, the preservationists, the curators, the editors. Uh, as well as the historians and archivists. Uh, these people have shaped the image of the university. It becomes part of the historical identity of the university. And so uh, that's uh, sort of one trying to, to investigate and to think more about how uh, especially uh, landscape and buildings do contribute uh, to the history that uh, we all know and share. <clears throat> So, these are the big five, okay? And it, probably everybody here, most people know uh, at least a couple of those names. Uh, the first historian of IU was David Banta, who was a trustee, but also the first dean of the law school uh, back when it got reorganized in the 1880s. He never wrote a book on IU history, but he gave uh, six lectures that then were republished and then became part of the uh, historical saga of IU. The second person was Theophilus Wiley, who wrote the first history of IU in 1890, uh, a, a, catalog, a catalog that basically uh, uh, had biographical sketches on every president, every professor, and every graduate of that time, up to 1890, okay? And this is a very valuable resource because he did a lot of work. It took him over 10 years to do that. Uh, and then uh, and he was the cousin of uh, the first president, uh, Andrew Wiley. So then uh, the, the third one was uh, 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 James Albert Woodburn, uh, who was a IU f uh, history professor uh, for a long time, uh, graduate of, of IU, and then also got a doctorate at uh, University of, sorry, uh, Johns Hopkins University in the 1890s. Uh, uh, he wrote the first volume of the history of IU. Um, and it's interesting, because he reprinted uh, Banta's work. Uh, it had been in the uh, alumni quarterly. Then he reprinted a, a few essays from himself that was also in the Alumni Quarterly, and then he did some new work uh, to end up. His, his, um, his area was 1820 to 1902. And so he, uh, <coughs> he was uh, an old man at that point. He, uh, 
he, he was born in 1856, and so he was uh, uh, 80, year, 80 years old um, uh, in 1940. Sorry, is that right? Yeah, no, that's right. Um, 84 years old. Um, and so, so anyway, he, uh, he finally finished that book with the aid of a person I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Then the third, the fourth one is uh, uh, Burton Myers, who was the dean of the of the medical school in Bloomington, uh, from the time it started in the early the 20th century uh, up to uh, he retired in 1940. He was also uh, um, a good friend of uh, William O'Brien, and the second volume of IU History is the Bryant administration, and that was published in 1952. Uh, it was also, um, he got a lot of help from uh, the same person that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. <clears throat> and then finally, uh, during the centennial preparations, um, IU hired a Kentucky historian from the University of Kentucky, Thomas T. Uh, uh, C. Clark, <clears throat> oh, sorry, what's, it? what's his last name? Uh, middle name. Thomas C. Clark, yes. Um, he, uh, <clears throat> he was hired uh, uh, in the uh, early, uh, mid-60s to uh, basically um, write a history of IU. Turns out it was three volumes uh, and also a, another volume with source materials uh, published in 1907 to 1977. Uh, he, he, was, he came to the attention of IU because he was a, um, a professor uh, of the president, uh, Elvis Starr, uh, back in the University of Kentucky. And so he um, basically wrote this uh, long narrative that goes back to the, the, the beginnings and, and then continued up to the, uh, the uh, late 1960s. So these are the big five historians. We have not had a, a comprehensive history or even a, 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 a <clears throat> just one volume of, of, of university history since that time. So that's been almost 50 years ago. And of course, some people thought, well, maybe we should do another volume of, of, uh, of university history. And uh, that was uh, basically uh, quas because that nobody wanted to do it, uh, <laughs> and and people don't read Thomas Clark's volumes. I mean, it's a great resource, but it's it's not a a, a, a something you read over uh, when you before before you go to bed. So anyway, so these are the big five. People have heard of heard of them. They were uh, all faculty members, uh, including. Thomas Clark, he was a, 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 a visiting uh, professor and stuff. So then I want to go back to the, the, the volumes of university history that I mentioned, the Woodburn and the Myers. Uh, this was um, Ivy Chamness, who was the editor of university publications for a long time, uh, almost 40 years. She got her bachelor's degree in 1906 from IU, and she became um, associated with the, the uh, uh, catalogs, the bulletins, and other special things that the university publishes. Uh, before that time, it was uh, the, uh, <coughs> the, the responsibility of the secretary to the board of trustees, uh, who was the person who was responsible for the, uh, the bulletins and the catalogs. And so then she also became the editor of the IU Alumni Quarterly, which was a precursor of the alumni magazine that we know. And she did that for 25 years. And she turned that into a, uh, the uh, journal of record for uh, university history. In fact, she was the first, she was the person who published uh, uh, David Banta's uh, early work on, on the history of IU. Uh, she cooperated with, uh, with um, um, Professor Woodburn to publish his stuff. She also did some her own stuff. Um, she also helped a whole lot with uh, Woodburn book and the, and the, um, 
the Myers book. She was also the editor of the Trustees and Officers of Indiana University uh, in 1951. <clears throat> so she was a person who is probably not very well known. Uh, she uh, lived alone. She was from uh, close to Richmond. Uh, she had some ambitions to become a, uh, a magazine writer, but uh, if you look in the archives, she spent, sent a lot of, uh, of, of um, articles to various magazines, and she got a lot of rejections. But she did find, she found a way to uh, be a writer and an editor uh, at IU um, all, th all through her life. So, <clears throat> so she worked closely with James Woodburn, uh, on that volume of uh, Indian University history. Uh, and she, he, he credits her in the, in the, um, the uh, preface uh, with that uh, quote that I have there. Uh, too much credit cannot be given to Miss Ivy L. Chambliss for helpfulness, helpfulness in this publication. Well, it's pretty clear uh, Woodburn started on the publication in 1929. And uh, he had retired up to Adam, Ann, Ann, Ann Arbor. And so Dr. Bryan was really concerned to get that book done. Uh, and uh, he kept on pestering Woodburn. And uh, she, he also got uh, Ivy, Ivy Chamness to start helping him. Uh, and so it took another, another uh, 11 years to get, get that published and then um, got published in 1940, after the, the new president, Herman Wells, uh, became uh, in office. So then the, uh, the other, the other um, volumes, uh, she helped with the second volume with uh, Myers. And so, <clears throat> in fact, both, Meyer, both Myers also did the trustees and officers book. And so if you look at the, um, the, the, uh, the title pages here, uh, we, we, see, we see Ivy Chamness as the first editor. And then the author is also an editor, OK? So the guy needed to have two times, of his, his name two times, I believe, uh, on, on that. So it's pretty clear that, that there's a lot of uh, s sort of uh, s sexism here about, about uh, credit and recognition and things like that. Um, I'll end with this uh, thing with, with Chamnus's story with uh, a little anecdote because uh, when she was 60 years old, um, the, um, the trustees hired a, a um, person uh, with the title editor of university publications, or sorry, director of university publications. Okay, so, so Ivy sent a letter to the trustees saying, well, I'm the editor of university publications, and the director seems like it's like I'm working for him, and he's, no, he's not, not my, my boss. And the, and the trustees, they considered it, and they didn't think it was a problem. And they just blew her off. And she she retired two years ago, two years two years later, and then uh, that person became the director of the university publications. And so they eliminated her job. But uh, but yeah, it, it's pretty it's pretty clear that um, she was really not um, recognized sufficiently and undervalued. Um, so then, <clears throat> and that's one of our one of my one of my people that I'm working on in my book. I'll have a chapter on. Uh, Chandler's career because she was very interesting as a as a historian also. So then uh, let's move to Mary Brown, Brown Craig, uh, who was the first university archivist uh, back in uh, 1943. <clears throat> she got her bachelor's degree in mathematics, and then got an MLS at Columbia, and started working for the libraries, and then <clears throat> she. Uh, she started working then with uh, the, what was called the President's File Room, uh, which was uh, in room 201 uh, in uh, Bryan Hall. Uh, as, as you might know, uh, room 200 is the President's office, and there was a file room right next door 
with a full-scale archive um, for all of the records of not just the current president, but the past presidents. And so, um, so she then became the um, head of the, of the archives. So at that point, Herman Wells was the president. He wanted to uh, think more about the, the, the uh, university's past and organize that. And we also had a dynamic director of the libraries, Robert Miller, who was uh, very much involved in the setting up of the archives. And Mary Craig uh, was not a trained archivist, uh, but she had a feel for history. And she was also uh, one of Herman's uh, um, person, uh, a person who would f find uh, new, uh, sorry, old furniture. She, she was an antiques hound. And so Herman uh, would go and visit uh, various um, places to find antiques, and then uh, Mary would uh, arrange for the, for the um, for, for their, their transport to Bloomington and then their storage uh, in the Wiley House or the Union or other places. And so uh, they, they were, Herman was, uh, she was the go-to person for Dr. Wells with his, um, his interest in, in uh, the uh, antiques. So then, <clears throat> and again, this is another person who is not well recognized uh, in the history of the university. So then another uh, person, persons, that you might recognize the name, uh, the, the Beck Chapels. Uh, Beck Chapel is named after uh, Frank and, and Daisy Beck. Uh, they endowed it. Uh, they both were uh, uh, um, uh, under, uh, undergraduates at IU. Um, and they were also contributing to, to IU history. They, they actually moved up to Chicago, and his, he was much involved in the uh, Urban League and um, uh, helping with the, the, poors, the poor people in uh, Chicago. And so, but then they came back and retired in Bloomington back in the 30s, and they were uh, very interested in, in sort of the, the campus and, the, and and, back, and, and, and uh, Frank actually wrote a, one of the few, few uh, uh, books on, on race relations here in Bloomington back in 1960, uh, sorry, in 1959. And then on the eve of Dr. Wells' retirement, uh, Daisy wrote an uh, informal history of IU that's really delightful. It's really well written and uh, some interesting uh, stories that she uh, uh, told. So moving along, um, Eleanor Rohr, who was uh, also a very interesting person, she, uh, <clears throat> she served uh, as secretary to uh, Dr. Kinsey during the, uh, for, for uh, uh, the time when he published The Sexual Behavior in the Human Female. Um, she had a she was she was a, a actual pilot, uh, and she had um, had had uh, gone to uh, pilot school uh, back in the 1940s. Then uh, she got her degree at NYU, a PhD, and became a uh, working for the State Department uh, as a uh, for, as a foreign affairs officer for uh, ten years. And then she came back to IU and became a special assistant to President Ryan uh, from 1976 to 1983. And she's also the author of the Trustees and Officers of Indiana University from 1950 to 1982. So it's the second volume of that, uh, that wonderful um, uh, reference book. So this is another person who you probably don't uh, know. Uh, and her, her book came out she had just finished the book, and it came out uh, right after she died, actually. <clears throat> and then this is uh, Dorothy Collins, Dottie Collins, um, who also worked uh, at the university. She was a speechwriter for President Starr uh, in the 60s. And then uh, she spent, um, for many years, as the research assistant for Dr. Wells. 
Um, <clears throat> she edited Being Lucky, uh, his memoir. Uh, it wouldn't have happened without her uh, input. Uh, she was an editor. Uh, she had worked for um, the, the Kinsey Institute and other uh, um, programs on campus. She's also the author of the introductory chronicle in the pictorial history of IU uh, in 1992. And that's probably the, the, the best single, short single uh, authored uh, publication on IU history that I'm aware of. It's really well done. Uh, but of course, it's in a pictorial history, so people don't read it for the words. They, re they look at the pictures. But uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that's uh, uh, wonderfully uh, con concise and, and really well done. <clears throat> so then um, another person here, uh, Alexander Urbel, uh, he was an IU uh, graduate student in history, um, working with uh, John Bodner, and he's interested in, in educational history. Uh, he's a faculty member now at Ramapo College in New Jersey, but uh, he did a, um, a, another short history of IU in the International Dictionaries of University Histories. And this is something I just found out uh, a couple years ago. Uh, it's a very uh, unusual reference book, but it's really well done. And so I talked to uh, Alexander and uh, talked to him about his time at IU back in the, uh, in the 1990s. Uh, he was a student of John Bodner's. And um, he had good things to say about IU, but he found this uh, assignment uh, to be of, of, of interest. So these are, this is just a, just a tiny a tr fraction of people who uh, people either are not thinking, they're not thought about as IU historians, uh, even though they did uh, do sub substantial work, or that they were undervalued, like uh, uh, Ivy Chan does. So, <clears throat> So then I want to go into uh, a, a couple of um, areas that I'm working on currently uh, in my book. <clears throat> One is the, the invention of, of IU history. OK, so IU history uh, got invented, in, in my estimation, in the 19, sorry, 1880s, OK? Uh, so my, my thought is that the, there were there were three people involved: uh, da David Banta, uh, Theosophy Wiley, and James Woodburn. Uh, most people don't think that uh, people understand that Banta and Wiley have been uh, associated. But Woodburn, early on, he w he actually did his um, his PhD dissertation at Johns Hopkins on education in Indiana, and it was a historical survey. And he also did. Uh, a substantial piece on IU history. Um, and he was in, in contact with both Banta and Wiley. And what's interesting is that Banta uh, represents uh, an older generation uh, uh, back in the 18, 1850s uh, as, a, as a student. Uh, then and, uh, Theophilus Wiley is, is uh, uh, even a little bit older than him. And then Woodburn is, is the youngest of that group. But these are all people who were uh, working uh, various aspects of IU history back uh, in the 1880s. Now, why is that? Okay. Um, well, <coughs> my argument is that there really wasn't a whole lot of things that were going on uh, back in the from the 1820s to 1880s. Okay. They didn't have much time for history. The university was about 40 students, 50, 60 students. Um, they were working a, a, a lot. Uh, there was no nothing that was uh, outstanding about IU uh, at that point. Uh, there were these were uh, the leaders were the uh, clergymen from uh, various uh, Protestant uh, of of uh, sex, um, and the oral tradition sufficed uh, for university history. Uh, now, there's one exception here. Uh, this book called The New Purchase in 1843, uh, done by Baynard Rush Hall, who was the first professor of IU, or what became IU. Uh, and he basically was trying to 
get even with uh, the bad treatment that he got from Pre President Wiley uh, in the 1832. And so he talked about, uh, this was like a, it was a fictionalized history, basically. And so he had a lot of different names, uh, different pseudonyms for, for people uh, who, who, were, uh, who were in the book. And uh, Dr. Wiley was called Dr. Blow Duplex. Uh, he blows hot and cold. <clears throat> and um, so then he, t so, 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 so uh, Hall really, t he, she did, he did talk about the beginning of the university because he was there, he, you know, obviously an uh, eyewitness. But he also, um, uh, was a wonderful um, evocation of uh, early uh, frontier days uh, in Bloomington and the, and the, and the, uh, and the region. And so, uh, but that was about it. There, was, there really is not, uh, nobody who's really talking about uh, history uh, in a formal way. So then in the 1880s, 1883, 1885, there were th two great ruptures in the university's history. They moved from Seminary Square to Duns Woods, which I think is, you know, huge. Uh, you know, Seminary Square had about uh, 10 or uh, 11 acres. They were right up against the railroad tracks. Um, they had cleared all the land of trees, and they didn't even worry about any kind of uh, landscaping. But they, they had a, a, a big fire in the, in the newest building, the two, two major billion, buildings, uh, uh, College Hall and, and Science Hall. Science Hall burned down uh, in 1883. <clears throat> And they were, and the trustees start thinking, well, maybe we should move around, move away to a, a, a bigger, a bigger place, a place we can expand. And then the other thing, uh, the other that happened, uh, uh, they were going to be moving to uh, the new place, and so then um, uh, the president at the time, Lemuel Moss, who was a Brad Bass's miniature, became uh, in. Uh, involved in a scandal uh, with a young professor, female professor, and uh, he basically was driven from office. And um, so then they, the trustees learnt, looked around and, and hired David Starr Jordan, who was a professor of biology at IU, uh, the first scientist, uh, the first uh, lay leader of the university. And so, um, uh, Jordan was really uh, helped us uh, get in step with national trends in terms of uh, majors and departmental organization and things like that. And so, so these two great ruptures, I think, uh, then there, there was a before and after that people could start thinking about, okay? That this was like we're going, we're going away from the, the old time uh, in, in the university. Uh, and also physically, we've moved away. And so then in 1889, uh, uh, Jordan um, instituted the Foundation Day, which is now Founders Day. And so that's when Banta started doing the, the, uh, the annual speeches uh, from 1889 to 1894. <clears throat> and so then uh, that's the same time that, that Wiley was working on his history. And then Woodburn uh, uh, was uh, doing his doctorate in higher education in Indiana. So these are all things that were happening uh, in that time because of those uh, uh, sense of uh, things are different and things are moving, things are changing, that we need to, to document that. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so one of the things I wanted to, to uh, move to the the idea that um, the move to Duns Woods and the, and the campus development is a very important aspect of the university's identity, as I mentioned. And so to think about uh, how to think about stories in stone or tales of the landscape, I mean, how, how do we like, understand that? Who designs, constructs, and care for the buildings and the grounds of the physical plant? Um, so we have a lot of people who are were involved in that uh, from the top, the top, the top people, but also 
the actual workers that actually uh, uh, planted trees and cut down trees and, and mowed the lawn and things like that. <clears throat> and IU has a, has a long history of outside consultants, uh, the Olmsted brothers, uh, the sons of uh, Frederick Law Olmsted, the guy who, who uh, uh, created uh, the um, Central Park in New York City. Uh, they, were, they were involved in the um, landscape design at IU in the 1920s and 30s. We had other people uh, uh, both before and after. And so there's a, a really interesting story to, to be researched about how that works with the outside people coming in and sort of uh, having their ideas, but also working with the, the administration, the faculty, uh, about uh, our campus and what, what it could be and what it should be. And so uh, as, we, as we all understand, uh, IU is a beautiful, beautiful place. It's a cultural landscape that that is, uh, uh, has been developed over now 130 some years. <clears throat> and so how do we think about that? And so how do we think about a cultural landscape? Okay, the idea that uh, the woodland theme is huge at IU uh, and that's been a consistent part of the, the landscape. Uh, when they went to Dunn's Woods in uh, 1885, they did not cut down the trees, okay? They cut down all the trees on the old campus, but so in 60 years, they started thinking, well, maybe forests are, are, are something that we need to value and to, to, you know, have a connection to our pioneer heritage and stuff. And so they made a decision early on about uh, keeping the wood intact, but building the, the uh, <clears throat> buildings around the perimeter of the woods. Then we also, uh, early on, uh, decided about the collegiate Gothic architecture. Uh, now this, this is a standard architecture for university buildings, but it's very consistent here at IU. But the other thing is we have local limestone uh, that is really wonderful for uh, that kind of building uh, uh, enterprise. And so then you can see uh, even back in the day when Dunn's Woods had 20 acres, we had buildings and we had the grounds. And so the interplay between the natural landscape and the man-made landscape uh, is part of uh, the, the intentionality of the campus and how people have been designing and thinking about the campus uh, as a physical place. <clears throat> so as you might know, uh, there's a recent book that uh, talks a lot about uh, the IUB as a cultural landscape. Uh, it was done by Terry Claypax. I don't, you guys should have him come and talk about, about uh, his book. It came out uh, to 2017. And so he talks about pretty much every major building on campus and major landscapes on campus. Now, can, the campus now has 2,000 acres, okay? So it's 100 times bigger than uh, it started uh, back in 1885. And Terry has a good job, does a good job talking about uh, some of the decisions and things like that that he was, in, he was involved in, you know, from the 70s onward. Uh, but he didn't really talk about the history of that landscape, how it became uh, this wonderful, beautiful landscape that we uh, all enjoy and love. And so what I'm trying to do is to sort of say, let's look at the backstory there and see how the growth of the campus uh, uh, in terms of like when did that happen over time? Who are some of the major designers and landscape architects? And who are some of the architects? And so to start thinking about the, the uh, landscapers and the architects is part of that story, okay? <clears throat> and so, and this is, I'm just giving you just a, a tiny uh, bit of, of my research. And so this is um, George Bunting, who was the first architect, architect of the Crescent, Crescent. So he created or designed three buildings, Owen Hall, Wiley Hall, and Maxwell Hall. So Owen and Wiley, as you know, uh, are brick buildings. They were uh, 
they were done in brick because they had to get uh, some, some buildings under roof because the classes needed to get started. So they used the bricks from the, uh, the um, Science Hall fire. They recycled those bricks, and they might have had a brick-making operation right on campus. Uh, but those two buildings were, were brick, brick. They also had limestone sills and things like that, so they had uh, limestone uh, ornaments and stuff. And then Maxwell Hall, which is the third, third building in that group, is uh, 1890. And that's a beautiful, beautiful building with all kinds of um, uh, interesting uh, uh, embellishments and, and architectural uh, novelties. It's a Romanesque, Romanesque building uh, that uh, is really, I think, the, the, the best building on the campus. <clears throat> um, so then, how about the people who are actually doing the, the work? William Ogg, who became a famous person actually on this campus, uh, he worked uh, for nearly 40 years uh, from the, the turn of the century to the 1938. He was the brother of Robert, Robert Ogg, who was a uh, trustee. So the, the Ogg family had, one, they had, they had enough money to, put, to send one of the brothers to school. And so they basically sent uh, <coughs> Robert uh, Ogg to school, and then William uh, had, to, had to work. But they were very uh, close, and it was, it, was, it was fine. And so William Ogg uh, was uh, the one, one person who was the keeper of the grounds at IU for many, many years. And so the, and he lived, he, he retired sometime in his 80s, OK? Um, and he lived in to be, to be, I think, 97. Uh, and so there's a wonderful tribute to the tr fr from the trustees about his, uh, his work. And he, he became a, a well-known figure on this campus. He talked to everybody, uh, students, faculty, staff, and administrators. So this is a long, uh, a long uh, thing here. I'll, as keeper of the ground, the gardener, he elevated a humble position through fidelity, industry, noble character, love of nature, and love of people that became an important position in the life of Indian University. He planted great trees, shrubs, and flowers in profusion that brightened the, the, the lives of people who took campus paths, the measure of which service will never be known. He did more as he worked. He talked with people in his calm, pleasant, and manly way. And many a one has gone out of his way a little bit to just have a chat with Mr. Ogg, their friend. Through his most wonderful character, fidelity, and kindness, he had made an enviable place for himself in a great university. Well, all the trustees knew him because he, they were, he, he was a student. He, sorry. He, they knew him as, a, as students, and then they became trustees and stuff. So, so basically, uh, he was very much involved in not just the, the physical landscape, but the sort of the, the, the cultural and, and, and mental landscape that, uh, that, that, um, that, that, that occurred. So I'm going to change uh, a little bit of a direction here. I'm, I'm, one, of the, one of the areas that I'm working on is the Wiley House. Uh, and everybody knows about the Wiley House, but I've got a few things that you might not know about the Wiley House. <clears throat> so, so Wiley House, uh, as we know, uh, next second Lincoln. So this is where, this is where you see the, the different people. So Andrew and Margaret Wiley, 24 years. Theophilus and Rebecca, 56 years. Amos and Lillian Hershey for two, 32 years, and then IU has owned it since uh, 1947. So this is the ownership record here. Okay, so this is a, you know, almost a 200-year house built in, in 1835. <clears throat> so then uh, it served as a family home uh, for uh, about 100 years. It was an antique shop for about 15 years. Uh, it was the IU Press Office for about 10 years, and then uh, the, they renovated it, and then it be, became a museum uh, uh, since 1965 or so. So those, those are the basic uh, things we're working with. So I want to talk about uh, 
I know people like to hear about Dr. Wells, and so uh, I, I, I had to uh, convince Michael not to uh, have a whole thing on Dr. Wells, but I will have a little thing on Dr. Wells uh, right now. Uh, so, so Wells, oh. So Wells in the Wiley House, okay. So Wells, uh, as I mentioned earlier, he was very interested in acquiring antiques, uh, even as a, a fairly young uh, professor. Uh, and he was a professor back in the 30s. He was invited to dinner parties at the Wiley House. Uh, Amos and Lillian Hershey would have dinner parties uh, at the Wiley House. So he knew the house. And so then, uh, when he was the acting president, uh, and that's, that summer, about a couple of months after he became acting president, he noticed that the, uh, the, the, the Wiley House was for sale in 1937. Okay, well, the trustees didn't actually even mention it again uh, in, the, in, the, in the minutes or anything like that, so they sort of ignored him. Um, and then uh, he was also uh, part of the gift to the University of the Woodburn House. Now, of course, he was actually living in Warburg House uh, from 1932 to 1957. So for 25 years, he lived in the Woodburn House. That was the president's house uh, after he became president. Okay, so uh, again, he, was, he knew James Woodburn, the guy who wrote the history of IU. So that's sort of the, some of the context uh, of that. So then, then in uh, two, two months after he became president, in, in, in March of 1938, he, got, he, get this he gets this letter <coughs> from Roy Quinn. And this is a person who I, I just can't find anything more about him. But he was a, in a, in a, as a res resident, and he was uh, wor worried about the, the neglect of uh, Andrew Wiley uh, because of the Foundation Day. And he was a, he was a Bloomington resident as a, as a younger person. I learned to love old IU and re, uh, uh, revel in its glorious past and foot, uh, pull for its promised future. But he said that uh, we should think about honoring William, uh, sorry, as we, uh, we should think about him honoring uh, the first president, Andrew Wiley. And so this is, uh, this is sort of this lament uh, and so, Wells never neglected his correspondence, so he wrote back. Um, so, uh, soon, saying uh, he totally agreed with that, because apparently uh, um, Wiley wasn't, been, wasn't well recognized at that point. So he said, well, let's get the senior class maybe to uh, do, do some kind of uh, wreath on his grave and things like that. Because his, his grave is a nice grave in, uh, in the old part of Rose Hill Cemetery. <clears throat> so then that was in, the, in May of 1938. So a year later, <clears throat> uh, Wells writes back to uh, Quinn and said that uh, we've got uh, some really nice um, service uh, to honor Wiley for the new Foundation Day uh, that year. Uh, these services mark the fulfillment of an idea you had a year ago. And what I hope they may become a part of any university's tradition for all the years to come. OK, this is 1939, OK? So there's nothing going on uh, with the Wiley House or or uh, not, nothing much more than, than uh, what he just talked about. So then, <clears throat> in 1945, after World War II, um, the, uh, the state legislature, or the, the uh, budget committee would come down uh, and visit IU every year to sort of see what's going on and see, make sure that they're, they're spending the, the money wisely. And then that was the same time that the governor had been in town. And so <clears throat> Wells said, uh, he told the, his driver to say, let's, let's go by the Wiley house. And so Governor Gates uh, said, what's that house? And Wells explained, well, that was a, the first president's house. And you know it's owned by 
you know, a, a widow of, uh, of a um, faculty member, uh, Amos Hershey. And uh, so Gates said, well, don't you think the university should have that house? And Wells said, well, yeah, I, I agree with that. And so they gave a, a special um, uh, uh, appropriation for buying that house in, in, in 1947. So then uh, Lillian Hershey was still, <coughs> was still uh, in the house, and uh, they allowed her to, to live out her, her life. Uh, and so she died in 1951, and so the university took possession at that point, and then uh, they moved uh, the, uh, <coughs> the, uh, oh, the IU Press uh, into, the, into the house because at that point, there was a lot of uh, space problems and stuff. <clears throat> so then they thought about, okay, what, what are we gonna do, be doing with this house, okay? So it's gonna be, um, could be a, uh, a museum, a guest house, a practice house for the home ec department, and things like that. But they went ahead and, and, and used it for the, um, the uh, <clears throat> um, IU Press. Okay, can you hear me now? Anyway, it, maybe it's time for me to stop talking. Please. Is that Mary Craig, the same old lady that lived in the Paris Dunning house with all the dogs? Yes, it is Mary Craig. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a, that's a, some other stories there. Come on down to this end. Yeah. No, that's the, 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 the president's house on campus is the William Lowe Bryan house. It was called the president's house when it was built in the 1920s. And, and then uh, when, when uh, after uh, President Bryan died, they renamed it in his honor. So it's, a, it's the Bryan house, the one on campus. Turn the speaker in this direction. The, the Woodburn House is uh, more. on on North College, across the street from uh, the uh, Big Red Liquor and a uh, block north of the Smallwood apartment complex. It's like uh, between uh, 9th and 10th of on on North College. No, it's, it, it's next to the, uh, yeah, it's still, it's still part of the university. Yeah. It's close to the, the farmer houses next door on the north. So there's two old houses on that, that block. The rest of them are all, all big um, apartment buildings and stuff, yeah. Please stand by. We're working on audio problems. Yes. <laughs> stand by what? <laughs> stand by your man. Yeah. Or we're out. We'll see what happens now. We can, we can still hear over here. Smoking. Okay, can you guys hear me now? Is yeah. it working now? Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Meanwhile. Okay, so then, um, so then, Dr. Wells actually wrote a historical article. Okay, the only the only historical article that I that I that he wrote, uh, and so uh, he actually talked to the Filson Club, which is the uh, Kentucky State Historical Group. Um, I don't know why it's you know, why he was talking about uh, IU history in Kentucky, but I don't know. Um, and so uh, then he wrote that up, and, it, and it's about, you know, you can see the, the title there. It's, it's about um, uh, uh, Andrew Wiley. And so 
Wells is always trying to sort of like push this, right? The idea that he's like, he's, he's responding to Roy Quinn, he bought the house, uh, you know, yeah, let's, let's, let's do, do something with, with Wiley uh, and to try to make it part of the university's history. And, uh, you know, it's a decent article. It's probably been, uh, I'm sure he got some help by uh, the archivists and the, ar and the librarians and stuff like that. So uh, then, so, so basically the idea that, that the Wiley House became a touchstone for IU's past. It sort of stood for a lot of different things. Uh, the house was kind of the embodiment of that legacy, that historical legacy uh, that's, you know, a long time ago now. It's over, uh, over 100 years ago. And so this is the, uh, this is the quote from his, uh, that article. The university is a durable institution built upon the accumulated wisdom of the past. How fortunate our past included Andrew Wiley. And so this is really the idea of trying to sort of use that as a way to, to increase knowledge and understanding about uh, the university's past. <clears throat> so then uh, there was a, a historic renovation. Uh, unfortunately, it occurred right before the national standards for historic preservation were published. That was published in 1964, uh, sort of nat nat national standards and stuff. And so they actually overdid, they took, took away a uh, a, a, a porch, a back porch that was actually a regional build, uh, part of the building. Um, but, you know, but in general, they did a pretty good job, uh, even though it wasn't to the national standards. Um, so then, uh, at some point, Wells started doing the, the, uh, the pilgrimage to Wiley's grave, and so I was still trying to figure out whether there was some, some, t some times they didn't do that, but the, the Founders' Day was the, the place where they did that. Uh, and that was usually, it's not during the actual birthday of IU, which was January 20th, because it's pretty damn cold. <laughs> and so they would have it in, uh, um, in uh, uh, May, basically. Um, and then uh, the, the idea that we're thinking about the, the Setswood Centennial, and Thomas Clark called it as a shrine to IU's past and a memorial to Andrew, f to the, fir and Andrew the First. <clears throat> And then Wells continued uh, by buying a property uh, to, on the northwest side uh, of the house uh, to buffer uh, development. Um, it became a National Register listing in 1977. Uh, Mary Craig retired that year. And then the first curator was Bonnie Williams, uh, who served for uh, 15 years. And so then during a oral history interview, Dr. Wells said, I took interest in anything that was a living reminder of the in in antiquity of the university. So that sort of summarizes his, his approach, the idea that this is important because it's a living reminder. Okay, And so then it got renamed the Wiley House Museum, and then the first director, uh, George, George, Joe Burgess, and then the Morton C. Bradley Education Center in 19... 2010, and then the current director, Kerry Beam. <clears throat> so that's sort of a quick overview of, of the Wiley House, and I'll be talking more about that in, in my book about its importance as part of the institutional, or say the uh, historical fabric. <clears throat> so I'm almost done here, but I also have a little extra thing for you. So this is, these, are, these are some of the thoughts that I, I have. Um, and you can see what I'm saying. I use a human institution for education and learning. History can contribute to, to identity, image, and inten integrity. University impact individual lives and serve to, con to connect. History is a thread that connects students, faculty, staff, alumni together, even when their experiences differ profoundly. That's why we can talk about people uh, from the way, way back in the past, that, that we have some human experience that we can understand. So do people want to, I, I think I've done almost an hour, but do you guys want me to hear, you want to hear more about the IU, IU Bicentennial program? I can do a quick update on that.
Yeah, okay. Thank you, Kay, for coming. Okay, this is uh, the Bicentennial Program at, at a glance, and I'll, I'll speed through this. We've got a bunch of uh, pro projects. We've got had some grant pro programs and inter internship programs. And so we're b building up to the bicentennial year, which is, is coming up uh, during the fiscal year, which is uh, uh, sorry, J July 1st through June 30th, uh, about a, a month from now. Okay, uh, things are not really going to get going until September, though. So and I'll talk about the calendar uh, just in a couple minutes here. So these are the things that we're doing. Uh, we've got lectures, we've got reunions, we've got. Uh, symposia, all kinds of stuff that, that have been planned. We've got public art and campus beautification, um, a, co a continuing concern. Now, of course, the other thing, too, is that you need to think about it's not just IU Bloomington, okay? Even though IU Bloomington is the only thing that's 200 years old, uh, we have a system of, of um, uh, seven campuses around the state, and so they're part of that, uh, that, that uh, historical um, um, uh, anniversary as well. And uh, even though they're not going back to that uh, 200 years, they're all going to be part of the, three, the, uh, the current uh, 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 next century. So then we've got heritage and legacy programs. We've got, uh, we're developing archives around the state. We've got uh, oral history projects. The the um, uh, historical markers. We've got a lot of a program that's actually trying to bring to light people who have not been recognized sufficiently, and, and so forth and so on. Uh, oh, we're going to do a data visualization. W what we've done is to uh, collect uh, names of every uh, graduate and where they came from, where they left, or where they go go to, and to actually do a a uh, data visualization that will have people coming in at all the different campuses and then going out uh, around the world. So that's something that might be uh, pretty interesting and, and uh, um, educational. We've got uh, public programs, a lot of al alumni stuff. Um, we've got a faculty research day uh, and so forth. We've also got um, a grand expedition. Uh, David Starr Jordan took uh, 20 or 30 students every, uh, every two years to Europe in the summertime. It's the beginning of sort of overseas programs um, in the 1880s. And so they're using that example as a way to then they're going to have uh, alumni programs and trips around uh, mostly uh, Western Europe. Uh, there'll be classes and alumni reunions and things like that. Uh, we've got bicentennial professorships, and oh, I've got a picture of the bicentennial medal in a minute, um, and a lot of things to engage the students, uh, including a uh, amazing race kind of thing where the there'll be teams from each campus that, that visit every other campus, um, and then we've got recognition programs. Um, oh yeah, this is the, this is the medal. Uh, it's uh, it's it's inspired by uh, the 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 uh, um, transportation routes, both air and uh, terrestrial transportation routes around Indiana. Um, so that's that's pretty cool. And this is the uh, calendar highlights. Uh, the uh, the opening festival is uh, J September 26th to the 29th. Uh, the, um, there's a cool conference called the, uh, informally the, the Mother of College Presidents. IU uh, has been known since the 1920s as the Mother of College Presidents. A lot of people who've either come to IU or ha have served on the faculty, they came, uh, became presidents. And there's something about, f about 400 presidents, uh, and a lot of them are still living. And so we've got uh, a symposium that will uh, examine the future of higher education using uh, the experience, it combined the experience of all those, uh, all those people. Uh, in fact, this is something that uh, Abby Chamness wrote about the first time uh, in the uh, Alumni Quarterly. So she was the responsible party to, uh, to um, get that going. Um, 
Then uh, the spring of 2000, uh, sorry, 2020, um, we've got the uh, 200th anniversary, which is actually January 20th, uh, the, the bicentennial race, and then the time capsule. We're having time ta capsules for each ca uh, campus. And then the summer of uh, 2020, we've got a bicentennial alumni reunion from uh, June 1st to the uh, 5th, and then the gala uh, the next day. Uh, and then the grand expeditions are going to be uh, later on that summer, and then the data visualizations will be available at that point. Um, so this is it. Uh, this is the IU uh, Bicentennial website, uh, uh, 200.iu.edu, so there's a lot of information there. So I'm open for questions, and thank you for your attention. Uh, well, it's, it's not written yet. Uh, I'm working on it. Uh, I, um, if, I, if I get it done in the next couple months, then it will come out sometime in the spring of 2020. So you, you can be sure that I will let you know. Yeah. Mark? Of course I miss Herman. <laughs> Uh, but he's still around, right? Yeah. Uh, Dave. Why does the Wiley House run by the library? That's a good question. I don't know the, all the details on that. It used to be sort of, it was sort of, in some ways, it was sort of the, the president's hobby horse, right? Uh, and so it was, it was run by Mary Craig, who was the archivist, right? But the archives was, was part of the president's office, right? Until about 12 or 20 years ago, you know, they moved into the, the library system uh, and moved from the president's office to, to the uh, library. So I think it's just a historical kind of accident, really. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, who else would do that? I mean, it's like, okay, it's got a, in some ways, it's a, it's a collection. It's not a book collection, but it's like, you know, it's a, it's a place to, 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 to store stuff. Yeah. Are you familiar with the greenhouse at Jordan Hall? Yes, the greenhouse at Jordan Hall. Okay. Was it originally a stone quarry? Uh, yeah, it was it was a, a very small stone quarry, uh, and it was called they they uh, as as it was ex excavated, then it became like a little. Uh, it was called the what's it called the. Sunken uh, Gardens. It's a passion pit. Yeah, it's it's a, the the Sunken Gardens or the Passion Pit pit. People go there to make out and stuff. I, I, but, I, yeah. I remember that when I was like in kindergarten. They had swans. Uh -huh. Yeah, there's some some, some water. Various. Yeah, so, some some water there, and so then so they that's the the current side of, of the Jordan Hall. Yeah, yeah. The the Ward Stone Company Quarry. Right. Yeah, and that's, uh, you know, there was also another uh, place that's close to the Good Kirkwood Observatory. Yes, sir. And uh, I consulted with some IU uh, geologists to figure out whether they used some of that stone in those first buildings, but there's no way to actually uh, to, to know that for sure. There, there's a possibility, definitely, yeah. Okay, we're done. Thank you guys.